Look, we all, the story, the characters, the art, it's all bullshit. Who cares? The point <laughs> is, yeah. it's a really satisfying game to play, and I'm having a great time. Speaking that's, of that's what matters. satisfying games, other than exactly. you know, Kony, also, I bought Divinity Original Sin 2, which I've been craving to buy for a while, and I did. Yeah. I only played a little bit, I just got off the ship, and I and I barely did anything. But I stole mm. eight buckets, or rather, I took eight buckets, I put one on my head, it's a helmet now. Um, <laughs> Wait, what I, is this? A Divinity, Divinity Original Sin 2. Mm, I, heard of it. I, it I, I regret not taking the skill to talk to animals because I missed out on talking to sheep, uh, to two sheep and one squirrel riding a skeleton cat. So, <laughs> sex to be me. <laughs> There's definitely a story there for sure. There's yes. Um, Alas, maybe next time. It's fun. It's pretty fun. I hate the fact that um, the way you control the camera is a little bit clunky and it takes getting used to because i'm used to like uh moving the camera around with my right mouse button but no sure. that's not how you do it i have to assign a different button uh, i mean like i think there's a default button yeah there's a default button but i assigned it to mm -hmm. a different button just because it's more comfortable for me to have it on the mouse uh but it's still it's still just so ah so annoying if i forget how to do it i just mess up the camera uh, work but thankfully it's a turn-based game so if i get into a battle i don't i'm not losing out on any time to mm -hmm. readjust my camera and stuff it's uh, like an homage to like the good. old uh rpgs of like like uh Baldur's gate and stuff right i haven't played Baldur's Gate, so no, but uh, yeah it's very very rpg like uh with with uh, nice enough graphics, uh, not super quality ones, but I mean they're good enough. They're, they're quite mm -hmm. neat. Uh, there's a skeleton dude that I may or may not romance. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who can <laughs> say? Uh, <laughs> I I am a tall elf lady. I'm elf glad Sans is flesh to gain the memories of the dead, oh. which is really cool. Okay. Uh, Just like that comic, Chew. <laughs> It's you know, just read chew. No, no, no. He has no. to. He, he can. He's like a detective who can like eat something, and if he eats something, he can like. It's sort of like a, a, a Bruce Willis in Unbreakable. He can just sort of like sense like where a thing was, mm. uh, and he, if he, he has to eat something to get its like not its memories, but like its history. I think. Mm. Yeah. Seen the concept thrown around, but yeah, like with these elves, uh, the one elf I met on the ship, she all like she's a lot better at uh telling uh like uh, reading memories of people. So like all she had to do was lick my arm, and you can let her lick or your arm or not. And I let her let her lick my arm, and she could tell memories from my character's past apparently. So that's neat. Delicious. I I like it. I that's like that's cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. I accidentally mm -hmm. became a slave to a red lizard, but uh, I I get... hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but um, I met up yeah. with him afterwards, and he was like, uh, never mind being the slave. You, you saved me, so you earned your freedom. So I was like, okay, cool. You know, I, I happen to watch that, uh, what's his fucking, like, Seth Sesniak or whatever, that fucking YouTube guy with the weird name. Uh, I, I watched his video on Vampire the Masquerades. You guys ever play that game? Because it oh, looked uh, pretty dope. I played the online one. When I was... Yeah. Younger, I tried playing it, but my computer couldn't run it. But it was kind of fun, but I didn't understand anything. I was just too stupid, I guess. <laughs> Seems like a, a fairly large brain game. It it was. I it's. Uh, I remember people talking about one of the vampire girls looking sort of like a trashy Harley Quinn version or something like yes, that. Yes, that's right. That's right. There's a new. There's a sequel to that game coming out, isn't there? I, I, they're working on it now, yeah. yeah, but people are pretty pretty hyped, as I understand it. Yeah. Right, right. It was sort of on sale, the game, but wasn't um, on a big enough sale for me to justify buying the uh, Masquerade game. Well, perhaps, I was just curious if, uh, if you yeah. I Seth played is a big I, fan, as it seems. He's got I a lot liked of positive it. things to say. Yeah, I, 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 liked, I, remember, I remember liking it, I just don't remember anything other about <laughs> anything else about it. Well, that's it. That's that's my whole thought on that matter. Uh, <laughs> uh, Philosophy Tube. Philosophy Tube just did a video. It's really good. It's about. I guess it's it's about the video game industry, but it's in mm -hmm. particular about like the work of Jim Sterling. Yeah, I saw that thumbnail, about, and he just dressed up as a, him. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's about how like um, it's about how like uh the tendency toward monopoly in in particular in the video mm -hmm. game industry can uh can let like uh, uh, companies like basically buy their way out of the supposed advantages offered by the, the free market. 
uh, Monopolies stuff. of which how... companies? The developers or the distributors or, or something? Uh, Publishers, right? Bo- both, I guess. Um, okay. Wherever the money is. Uh, I know okay. just Jim Sterling usually has issues with publishers more than anything else. That's like his go-to to uh, yeah make money. I would think so. Piss off, yeah. piss okay. on the publishers, okay. which yeah, is not, which not is usually devel- justified. Not the developers in particular so much. Okay. okay. Uh, but, you know, it's like loot boxes and what I uh, say. Sh- you know, ways ways that like uh like like moves that the 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 video game industry makes towards like extracting more value without providing a better product or like providing a service to more people or anything like that. Sure. I think we can and, all like, get and the and the and, and the rent the rentier economy where you make money not by producing anything but just by owning something whether it's like a building that you rent or just like intellectual property rights that you just have. Hmm. And, I'm sensing a certain yeah. ideological bent to to some of these points. No, shit. no, no. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, those those are those are good things to. to, to I mean, shit. fucking. I wish that. Um, oh shit! I was just Solid. thinking about a game that. I, oh, uh, Metal Gear Rising Two, Metal Gear uh, Revengeance will never get made because Konami has the fucking lockdown on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's nothing to be done. Sometimes but, I think you know, about that and I die a little bit more inside every time. I yeah yeah you know I, I just saw a guy on 4chan who just had a thread with a picture of. Of, of Jack about to let her rip. I just beat Revengeance. <laughs> Wasn't like, it uh, sick? Yesterday Wasn't it sick? It it was sick. It was dope. And you know what? Yeah. I was. Uh, the, I, I didn't expect to, but the the senator was making. Okay, dude. There, there's don't say he was making Armstrong some good was points. red pilled as fuck. Okay, is it dude. not? He was making some good points and many terrible ones. Like, I mean, surely okay. you know this is a sure. A reasonable, yeah, yeah, sure. You got to pepper some tr- some truth in there. <laughs> of course. Like his the whole premise of this thing was like, I want America and Americans to, to be, be great free again from Legend. the war economy and to be free to fight for things they believe in, not be slaves of this like weird fucked up. Uh, uh, you know, a fucking thing where they're fighting for values they don't give a shit about or they don't understand. We, it's sure. basically like a criticism of neoliberalism, I underst- as I understand it. Uh, but, like, uh, I'm noticing that maybe? what he's saying is we want this for Americans and we will start wars to get there. Fuck everybody else. Well, okay. I mean, I don't know if I'm for starting many, many wars for the benefit of the Americans that survive at the end of the day. Is, this the, idea, doesn't seem... is the idea that just America's gotta, like, fucking conquer everything so we don't have to fight anymore is that the plan i'm not gonna lie i need to see it again to fully digest his point because i okay. uh, he, you know, he makes us rising speech while he's beating the shit out of you so there's a, uh, there's true, a couple things going true. on in the scene at once i well, was just, yeah. i get the feeling that he's just like luffy he's just like you know the 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 like the king of the pirates is is the one who's the most free. So America's got to well, be king of the pirates. I mean, he so comes can be in free. And, and, you know, Ryden's fighting him. And Ryden's like, oh, I know what you're up to, Senator. Like, you're a selfish crook, politician, just like everybody else. You just want to like, start war to personally profit off of it. And then Armstrong mm-hmm. comes in. He's like, no, no, no. Foolish child. You don't understand anything. <laughs> like, Foolish he actually child. has sincere beliefs. But his sincere mm-hmm. beliefs are, like, first of all, you know, he literally says, make America great again. It's fucking it's insane. The, the best, the best, best moment that's says epic. It. In that's video um, games. Oh my before god. Before Trump ever fucking ran. <laughs> I, I mean, I think Reagan had said it, so like maybe they lifted it from Reagan or something. Whatever, it doesn't matter. No, well, he Reagan never said, said make America, America great. Reagan. And that's why yeah. Trump used make America great again. It was like a callback. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure someone to in the past used the phrase make America great. <laughs> I, I was again. just wondering but it was if this no, was lifted it was, from something. But. It wasn't yeah, it was, it was Senator Armstrong, before. the legend. Oh, oh, right, of course. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. So, oh, oh, what was the point I was making? Just so, like, Ryan th- assumes he's just an evil, corrupt politician. It, like, in actuality, it's a bit more complicated. The senator, he actually wants, like, America to be free. He actually does seem to have this, like, libertarian mindset yeah, he about He wants us himself. to be king of the pirates. Uh, I assume. Well, yeah, because because free, yeah, because he doesn't want to. He's he's not a fascist. He's just willing to engage in war to like, like down America. Uh, he, I guess you'd call it accelerationism or whatever. He wants massive wars to like just to literally drain the swamp and shatter like the current existing status quo, and then impose, as I understand it, like basically anarcho-capitalism or something, where people are just on their own. Like the weak will be subjugated by the strong because that's how it should be. You know, things things of this nature. Okay, seem to be I his, see. I yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, that's some. 
some randy and shit <laughs> yeah pretty much pretty much yeah and you know yeah. what there's a lot of appeal <laughs> there's a lot of appeal <laughs> epic like a banana there's a lot of appeal going on here mm-hmm. um, see ben, yeah. ben it all it all works out for you because Raiden like slices his chest open and crushes his still beating heart uh, as you it was would like it to sick. be it was fucking sick it was fucking i've seen shit. I, I like I don't really I I'm not a Metal Gear guy I've mm-hmm. like barely mm-hmm. played any Metal Gear so I haven't played Revengeance but I've seen um, Matthew Matosis's video about yes. uh, Revengeance so I know about the battle with Armstrong and it does look sick. Oh, as it's you know grand. some people were saying that like Nate a lot of people think this is the best final boss of all time like what do you think? Yeah. And I was like it's definitely up there. Uh, I still yeah. you know Xemnas and Kingdom Hearts two what can I say. Best I mean, game it's fuck- ever. I mean, Armstrong is ever. cool as hell. Right? Yeah, no doubt. He, no he, fucking like, doubt. He is undeniably. A, a and I mean, Nate, he, Nate, up to this point, he's just awesome. a fucking politician who who then you yeah. think is just piloting a Metal Gear. But no, right. he's also no. a nanomachine Dude. powered monster man. <laughs> I was so insane. happy. I played that game way late, but I didn't spoil myself on anything. So I, all of it was just like pure fucking hype. Holy like, shit! The, uh, the amazing fucking cheesy line when Jack's like, you know, it's like. Uh, you know, I thought my sword was a tool for justice, but I might have been wrong. Besides, this isn't my sword. And I was like, oh, yeah, fuck. That's yeah, that's a great yeah, fucking let's line, do this shit. That's a great fucking line. Oh, my God. Uh, but, y- you know, Ben, there's one other point. Sp- speaking of One Piece, as we were saying before, I was curious. Um, here, I'm going to post an image that, uh, okay, okay, apparently this came afterward, but I can't help but feel like there are a lot of similarities between, like, hockey in general and, uh, like, the senator. Now, the I don't know which came Doesn't he wit. turn his arms black? With, like, he, he, his whole body becomes goo? black at various yeah. points. Yeah. And my boy Virgo here uh, mm, is just, yeah. first of all, problematic blackface. Not appreciating that, Virgo. Although, I, I still argue he's black. <laughs> not <coded. appreciate>, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm just saying, there's a lot of similarities between these two characters. And uh, I believe One Piece did invent hockey first, like a couple of years before uh, Revengeance came out. So I'm wondering if perhaps Revengeance decided to crib a little bit from One Piece. I, I don't know. I don't know. These things are uh, fairly we'll similar. We'll never know. I mean, man, we'll never I, know. I, I saw um, who was it? There was a no. It wasn't Renegade Cut. It was um, uh, no, uh, that, uh, Super Bunny Hop. Super Bunny Hop made a video. I, w- I was rewatching some Super Bunny. Yeah, Hop I'm yesterday. sorry. Just look at this. You might not like it, but this is what peak male form <laughs> looks like. <laughs> 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 oh, fuck yeah, Virgo. Oh my god. <laughs> What yeah, a legend! He's beautiful. He's, he's Dude, he needs traps. To, he needs to hang out with Tagoro immediately. <laughs> they would he's be bros like forever. Bundle. He's just a big bundle of ropes. Uh, um, that's correct. Also, he got so much bigger. It just, just for comparison's sake, look at him in the manga. Like he's, he's still huge, but not on this level in the, in the fucking anime. Um, yeah. Well done, boys. Well done. I'm, I'm glad they dialed it up to 11. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But, but the I'm Super not. Bunny Hop is a video about um, mm-hmm. uh, Evangelion and uh, Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. And, you know, there's a bunch to say about that. But, like, in particular, like, like Evangelion is, like, culturally ubiquitous over there. It's, like, it's like yeah, known yeah. Uh, in the way that, like, Star Wars is... is is like widely known over here, which is incredible. Yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't re- really know it was like to that extent. But mm-hmm. I imagine One Piece is probably like kind of the same. Like everybody knows One Piece, yeah, at least to a there. degree. They'll, they'll know Luffy. Yeah. They'll know Chopper, probably things like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So like, I'd be, I'd be kind of. It wouldn't be surprising if like some concepts from One Piece had bled into someone like someone like um. Oh fuck! What's the what's the Metal Gear Solid guy's name? Raiden? Raiden? No, the guy oh, who uh, made Kojima, it. Kojima. Yeah, it wouldn't be surprising if some had bled into it. Like, just from such, like, a hugely popular, culturally ubiquitous franchise yeah, like One it's Piece. it's not crazy to think. And he's the kind of happen. guy, like, like, Metal Gear Solid is a fucking cultural mishmash that he just made up from shit that mm-hmm. he'd seen. Like, like any work of art is, so, sure. you know. Hey, did you know that out of every five Japanese citizens, one of them has a One Piece podcast? Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, the potty cast is just is just wrote daily life over in there's Japan. There's so much. Yeah, there's you'll never run out of content to consume. <laughs> Learn Japanese right now. It's, yeah, it's wise. It's wise. Yeah. Um, what? Munchie just called me. Oh, Munchie. No. <laughs> why did he call you? Munchie, if you have time to I, call Ben, well, you have time to be on the podcast. Call into the bitch. show, why don't you? Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah. Wait, well, okay. Uh, he's- He's typing. Let's 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 get an explanation for this. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> explain I mean, yourself. I'll be happy okay, to hear you don't what he have, has to say. But you don't speaking, have to wait for it. I don't know how long it'll be. Okay. <laughs> we could, uh, it might we be, could go it, to the fucking voicemails. It might voicemails. be a whole novel. Oh yeah, voicemails. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I got we only got a couple here, but uh, there's I think there's four total today, so not uh, nothing nothing too brutal. Yeah, all right, fuck it. You guys, we're we're good. Go to voice. Uh, I'm ready. Good. good. Okay. Um, let me see. Of course, everybody leave, uh, down below in the description, there's a link to the speak pipe. Leave us voicemails so we can play them on the show if they are of a quality persuasion. Uh, okay, let's let's go to first one. First up is, let me see. Uh, oh, yes, here we go. This is the uh, No Nut November Comrade, as in comrade, but C-U-M, uh, sends message to enemy coomers. Okay, well, it's December 1st today. So the walls are splattered white across the <laughs> nation, across the world. So let's uh, let's see what he has to say for himself. Go. 30 of November, 2019. T minus seven hours till the big nut. Dew drops. And you know what? She calls me a noob. She unfriends me on Xbox Live. Oh, now, no. oh I see the what a tragedy. Side. Now, I'm always saying the N-word, Nick. <laughs> uh, he finally sees the sunny side. I mean, wait, the funny side of life. Uh, right, uh, right, you yeah, gotta good. S- I've, I've learned my new favorite euphemism is the gamer mm-hmm. word. Yes, yeah, that's I, a good one. I learned that's that uh, recently. Um, Sometimes you have a gamer moment when you say the gamer word. <laughs> yeah, it happens. <laughs> happens, happens to, to the, the best, best of us. us. Um, <laughs> what, what, is, okay, what exactly is an e is it just a girl you know on the internet? Um, like it's, I mean, it's, I, I, say... I thought that it was like a titty streamer or like a, a yeah. like a, a, a celeb. Right. I would. I would think it's, it's mildly girl... defamatory to just call any girl online an e girl. That doesn't seem. I thought it was like there's no distinction. Who had some sort of like uh, presence or trying to do something on the internet. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like, you're not I mean, just urban on dictionary. the internet. Nate, 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 Nate. Yeah. Your turn yeah. of uh, Urban Dictionary. Yes. Oh, She's right. oh you're right. She's okay. right. Very let's, true. let's go. Why, why guess when we didn't well, know? Well, because I yeah, I thought it was like a female <laughs> e-celeb, but then I feel like people toss the word around in a way that it just means any girl on the internet. You no, know, I, I think it's it's kind of a nebula, or it, uh, it's a yeah. got fuzzy and edges. I just, so and it has about. multiple definitions depending okay, on Okay, well here's ask. the top one on Urban Dictionary, e-girl. Finally we've got the authority away in. Okay, here we go. E-girl. An e-girl is a species of emo usually found what? on TikTok no. but commonly spends time on Tumblr. All Can right, I don't give a shit about the Zoomer eyeshadow. definition. Yeah. Well, I don't know what an adult has to say on the matter. <laughs> I mean, the, <laughs> you, you uh, don't, commonly don't. found doing the me 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 meme dance but has probably never seen it before. Okay, some of these you things You do seem not reasonable. have to be emo to be an e-girl. Okay, Get all right. Let's go to de- definition here. 2 here. This second definition is better, I think. Okay, here we go. So definition one of, of section two here is, uh, okay, e-girls are usually girls who play games online and can be found on either Twitter or Discord. They send nudes slash thirst traps or even sell them. They can also be found on Twitch, but the difference between a normal girl who plays video games and an e-girl, okay, good, we're making the distinction, is that an e-girl begs for money or sells herself for mm. it. You, you can theoretically beg for money and not be an e-girl, but if you're, like, selling sexy pics, that's that's definitely e-girl that territory. That seems I much closer to my general understanding of e-girl. I've, yeah, I've seen I've seen Discord servers like say yeah. that like we have e-girls in our Discord server as like a selling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought it was going to be a negative. Like, stay away. We've got e-girls in our ranks. Don't come in here, boys. Protect. No, like when I when I went on like various um, there are sites that like you can like search mm-hmm. and find um. Discord servers on, and I put like, Endless War on a couple of them, like, just to... Tr- oh, you know Ben was Googling how to meet e-girls <laughs> online. Please, someone tell and me. I, I, saw, I, I, I would see the term e-girl, and I was like, like, join our server, you know, we're a, we're a cute, comfy, community, community-based community uh-huh. server, you know, we got custom roles, we got e-girls, we got e-boys, and I'm like, do we want Weird. those things? Are those good things? I don't... It depends on the perspective, <laughs> yeah, but uh, generally I'll be being spending my evenings a... at the opera. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Not on your Discord server. I, I think when you call girl an e girl, usually it could be taken as a bad thing to be called. But uh, so some people just wear it with Unless pride. Unless you're pro I guess. slut. You know, pro it slut. Really, it really depends uh, yeah. on the perspective and the person. We yeah, call, we call it, it, it seems we call vaguely it sex positive these days. You're right. <laughs> I prefer my ancient term, pro slut. Uh, but yeah, you're right. You're right. 
Uh, okay. I don't know. I, it's open to interpretation. If you like it, great. W w as a father or a, a mother, would you want your daughter to be an e-girl? Perhaps that's the operative question to ask. Probably not in the strictest definition of the term. No. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Oh, but you know, uh, like, uh, you know, I was thinking that, like, if someone, if, like, a girl is in a, you know, these these Discord chat girls who will come in there, and they'll, they'll start to throw around some oo-woos, mm. they'll start to throw around some o-woes, yeah, and mage. it's like, you know what they're doing. They're baiting me. I can't resist an oo-woo, especially <laughs> capitalized, bolded, <laughs> italicized. I'm putty in their hands. And this is female power, and frankly, it's toxic. Mage, and it has to be changed. Mage is oo-wooing right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's this not oo-wooing, it's nyoron. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, God, I'm sorry. I apologize. That's another level. Mage is advanced here. I'm not even ready to face <laughs> oh. that kind of demon. You know, I I just thought I'd play this one briefly as an example. This seems like a good voicemail. Just listen to how unintelligible this voicemail is from the ghost of scumbag Chris. If you want to go listen to it, it's on the fucking SoundCloud. Just just give this a listen for one second. Oh oh shit, it didn't work. Uh, Wait, hang on. This is pretty bad. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Okay. Totally and inaudible. Go. <laughs> I just wanted to point out the first user of Fine Group is the best, and it only becomes such by the end of the event. See, can you make out any of this? Mm, I see the problem. Bits and right, pieces. Stop, stop. Disconnecting. I, I heard it's the something word about, November. I heard There's November. Something about, yeah, No Nut November was being discussed. I, I just, guys. You should listen back to your own shit if you listen, because that I just cannot that's, fucking that's tell. Okay, no, 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 li listening back. Saying. No, no, listening back isn't gonna work because you know what it's supposed to say, so you hear it. Ask someone else to listen it for you. Y you know that's a better if, suggestion. If you're not sure, yeah, suggestion. get a second opinion. That like, because yeah. some people I know they'll like play something on a speaker and hold it up to their microphone, and it gets more distorted or, or things of this nature. I, I know there are some ways around it that some people. This is just, just one of these public announcements. If it's unintelligible, even if it sounds potentially good, uh, obviously it's uh, going to be an issue mm -hmm. for, for playing on the show. It's actually um, bad. It's it's actually uh, not quality. All right. uh, well, speak. I mean, Let, that's it. That's our last voicemail. Than... Wait, really? Yeah, wow. I mean, there was just a couple today. Oh, there were, uh, we've only gone too many. We're only on an hour and eighteen. Uh oh, my, my stall God. for time. Only, stall for only, time. Only oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. I skipped one. I did actually skip one. Now that I now that I look at it. Whoops. Oh, it okay, better be right. a good one. It's gonna one. be a forty-minute voicemail. <laughs> Save us. <laughs> uh, oh, it's it's one hundred percent not. It's, nice. No, it's not. I, this is another kind of. Okay, let me just fucking play it. All right, here you go. Uh, it's voicemail god redemption. Go. Mm -hmm. What's up, voicemail god? I'll try to make it quick. Okay, so look, I don't think it's very fair that you're giving other people chance to start arcs and finish their arcs when you're not willing to finish mine. Bam. I just want some redemption. Can you please finish my arc? Guess who I am? Hippo, Nate, Ben. Oh my god. <laughs> the most you guys could know me. Your other hint is Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts, okay? It'll all make sense in due time. Are you are you Keyblade Spirit? Is that you? I don't fucking know. That that could be you. It definitely could be you. But listen to the entitlement once again. <laughs> it's not fair you finish other people's um... arcs. Okay, you know what? I'll, I'll give you that. Keyblade, is, Keyblade, Spirit, you Keyblade Spirit is a good guess. Like <laughs> I have no other yeah. guess beside that, so I'm just gonna go with it. Uh, are you Keyblade Spirit? There you go. But uh, uh, I mean, you must certainly understand a uh, fair voice. Oh, note, God. Hey, you know what? You know what happened? Yeah. Something funny happened. What? In uh, it was uh, during Slime Fest. Oh wait. Oh yeah. You know what? I I wanted to say something. Uh, people don't know. We Rowdy Fuckers Cop Killers is on a new channel. And oh, that's right. The that's newest. Right. So like the full like real episode, not a not a Twitch VOD re-uploaded, but like an actual mm -hmm. like me and Munchie sit down and make like a three hour long actual RFCK episode is up. It is the most recent video on the Rowdy Fuckers Cop Kills channel, and it's only got like 400 views. And I think a lot of people just don't know it's there, but it is. Yeah, I think you're right. We've moved to a new channel, so link in the description for that. Okay. Excellent. Um, Speaking um, of Munchie, did he ever explain himself to oh, you why he called yes, you? Yes, he did. He said, uh, "I'm." Oops, I didn't mean to call you, but I did mean to ask uh, if I got clearance to listen to Storm Before the Storm, which is a book we were talking about that I did listen to on Audible, uh, but I was going to listen to it again, but I think he wants to do it, and yeah, I'm, I'm not re-listening to it. And so the answer was yes. Um, <laughs> yes, Word. been listening to books. <laughs> uh, uh, I was, um, so I was streaming. We were streaming Slime Fest yesterday, mm -hmm. and at the end... At the very end of it, um, spoiler alert, I won the moral victory, as always. 
<laughs> way to go. Which is another way of saying of losing that's, the actual competition. That's, that's not true. That's just that's just not true. It's all in how you look okay, at it. Okay, understood. Victory is a social construct. And right. um, uh, so at the very end, we were talking about what the next contest would be. And I mm. said, a karaoke contest. And I was reminded of the karaoke contest between uh, Christine Weston Chandler and Liquid mm -hmm. Chris, Solid Chris and Liquid Chris, when Chris right. challenged Liquid to a Sing Star karaoke contest to determine who was the real Chris. And I, I said this. Incredible. And then I went back to record, uh, to, to, to um, uh, um, what's the word? To uh, make the VOD, to highlight the VOD yeah. so it would be saved. And I see at the very end, after I said that, uh, Chris appears in chat to say, yeah. like, hmm, a, a karaoke contest to say who's who sounds a little too familiar. Lol. And I was like, lol, she heard me say the whole thing. And I just missed, That's hilarious. I think that was the only comment she made. And she just, like, shows up to my streams now. It's pretty funny. Well, I mean, yeah, clearly invested in the narrative to some degree. It's, it's pretty funny. I've been a little I've been a little slower on the slime and punishment updates lately, but I've got I've got mm. a couple in the can ready to go. Uh, maybe later today or tomorrow. Sick, sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm look, I, I've been checking your feed, looking for him regularly. So uh, you've got at least one person. Yeah, you've got at least one person who gives a <laughs> fuck. I'm really looking, for, really looking forward. I to mean, I'm not gonna lie. I'm I'm holding out for that keg standard cameo. Although I did see him in uh, uh what was it? Phantom Horn was like thinking about something, and I had a he's, little thought bubble. He's talking of, uh, to, yeah, he's talking to um, uh, Doopy and Tupity, and he's right, talking right. about the importance <laughs> of. Today, I learned about the importance of loving your brother, even when you don't mm. always get along. Uh, line <laughs> crib directly from Friendship is, is Witchcraft. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> um, I think. I guess it won't spoil too much. I think there will be probably be a keg cameo in the epilogue. Sure. Seems, seems I think that would be an appropriate time for it. Uh, hey, as yes. long as it's appropriate. Yeah. No, uh, no interference here with the artistic process. Yeah, and I won't say in what context, but that's, good, that's good. the tentative plan. So, guys, you can you can all put down your pitchforks, your favorite character. <laughs> uh, just give it a little time. All these bullshit meme side characters, they'll get out of the way soon. I'm really beloved hero i'm really looking Ooh, forward to having it done because i feel like when i say guys it's done it's mm. finished i feel like that's the point when a lot of people be like oh okay if it's actually done then maybe i'll go yeah. back and read it because like that's You're what definitely that's right. what i did with bail jape like when hippo said like oh yeah i just released the finale it's over i was like mm -hmm. oh shit i guess mm -hmm. i gotta read it now and i did and i love a finished product yeah yeah mm -hmm. read bail speaking jape of finished products uh we should we should show the the new bonus episode because it's good or so. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Uh, yeah, maybe I would have remembered it at the end. But yeah, the new bonus episode is uh, oh, the day of recording. I'll, I'll be releasing it uh, after we're done. And it's game development. And there's a whole bunch of links to games we've made, including uh, the ones we mentioned before. There's my little demo I made with my buddy John. Um, uh, I forget, uh, Untitled Music Jumper featuring QT Bass Drop. There's, the, of course, the Azumi game stuff is linked in there. Uh, Mage has some works, uh, some artwork from various projects. Uh, uh, I think other my things too. Saint, the Saint Comics, uh, the Champion game, which has yeah, just been right, up right. on SaintComics.com the whole time. But I link link that too, I guess. Indeed. Also, oh, oh, there's game. my old game Bell I made with my buddy uh, Rich back in the day in college. That was that's a good time too. An endless war. Mm. <laughs> slime game. Slime if you can call gang. it a game, slime not game. A lifestyle. It's more of it's more of a it's more of a lifestyle choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, we've delayed long enough. We can wrap it up here, I think, boys and girls. That's we've done our due diligence. Mm -hmm. uh, we won't torment you any longer. Yeah. So uh, let's see what's going on. Of course, patreoncom slash the procrastinators is always going on. It's the hip happening place for all your social media updates and currency draining exchanges. If you're uh, on five dollars, if you're on the, if you're on the you get all the bonus server, you don't even need Twitter anymore. It's it's just outdated. Yeah. At that yeah, point. get off Twitter <laughs> and so get true. in the PCP Discord. That's that's <laughs> very it. true. That's what it's very about. true. Better anyway. Um, oh, you know, all the, the the other day, someone in your Discord, Ben. For for they first of all, they added me. They added me specifically. Did they? And just said like some some. I mean, in my opinion, it was horrific bullshit. Uh, but I mean, the way that I I, I read it, I, I I won't say their name because like we we made peace. But it sounded like what this person 
point was like, hey Nate, just so you know, like everything you've ever done is like a pale shadow of Digi and you're pathetic and I don't respect you. Oh, wow. oh, I mean, oh dear. I mean, okay, I'm exaggerating for comedic effect right now, but that was kind of the gist of what I read into it. When actually, as we, te so I got very angry, uh -huh. but as we teased it out, their point seemed more to be, hey Nate, I don't actually think content is the best use of your time and would prefer you to do like your big videos. And I'll, well, okay, just say that then. Yeah, uh, that's, as opposed that's a very to, different. That's a but very it, different. But if they just said right? that, they wouldn't make you mad and get a response out of you. Oh my God, you've cracked the code. No, that's very true. Culture. That's you know. Works again. That's true. Uh, but I mean, the way that I, I, I read it, I, I, I won't say their name because like we, we made peace, but it sounded like what this person's point was like, hey, Nate, just so you know, like everything you've ever done is like a pale shadow of Digi and you're pathetic and I don't respect you. Oh, wow. oh. I mean, oh, I mean, OK, I'm exaggerating for comedic effect right now, but that was kind of the gist of what I read into it when actually as we te so I got very angry teased it out, their point seemed more to be, hey Nate, I don't actually think content is the best use of your time and would prefer you to do like your big videos. And I'll, well, okay, just say that then. Yeah, uh, that's, as opposed that's a to, very different. That's a <laughs> very it, different But if they just said right? that, they wouldn't make you mad and get a response out of you. Oh my God, you've cracked the code. No, that's very true. Culture. That's, you know. Works again. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, it's all right. It's all right. Message uh, interpreted better and uh, all, all is well. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh yes, of course, money. Patreon.com slash The Procrastinators. Uh, $5 bonus episodes, Game Dev 1. Actually a good bonus episode, guys. Actually a good one. What do you mean? One. They're all I gems. I don't know They're what They're all you're gems, but some about. sparkle more well, than well, Most of them are gems in the rough, so just lumps of coal. <laughs> but but <laughs> this, one, right. this one is actually a one. This one's <laughs> so. We all have experience lustrous. projects to share. E e indeed, e indeed. E um, and uh, go listen to that and the 31 other episodes, 32 total of the bonus episodes. No, it's on the Patreon. Good One dollar, you're in the bonus, uh, not the bonus, the uh, the PCB Discord, the Patreon Discord. Good times. Be there, obviously, as we said before. Um, also, go give five dollars a month to the PCB Minecraft server if you want as well. Hey. Play Minecraft with us. We got a stream coming up. Um, I think right now we have for Friday, December the 13th. So uh, keep an eye out for that if you want to play. So we'll, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll be there around then sometime in December. And um, what else is going on? At TB Crastinators on Twitter. Updates and whatnot. Retweets, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, of course, speak pipe. Leave more voicemails uh, so that we can respond to them here on the show. Thanks, everybody, for doing that. Voicemail God. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Speak we'll see you next week, And there it is. Character art concluded. There uh, you go. Forgiveness. <laughs> redemption. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you next week, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. So the majority of viewers wanted to see the Romulan arc played out at least to the point of new Romulus. From there, we will return to the Starfleet series and pick up from then on. But before we make it to the New Republic space, I thought it a good idea to create a timeline showing just how the Romulan Star Empire ended up so fractured. To begin with, there's a list of key players that we'll need to familiarise ourselves with. In fact, the Romulan history between 2370 and 2409 is so full of and betrayals and characters that it's a veritable Game of Thrones out there. But we'll cover everything in an overview, right up until the formation of the Romulan Republic according to the lore of Star Trek Online. Ambassador Spock the former officer, now turned ambassador, has devoted his remaining life to attempting to foster relations between Romulus and Vulcan, starting an underground movement of unificationists who follow his ideals. We have Datan, who was born in 2356 and the leader of the Romulan Republic. He was a protege of Ambassador Spock and has been present in the unification episodes of TNG as a child. Jean-Luc Picard, Starfleet captain and protagonist of the shows, he eventually resigned from Starfleet to pursue an ambassadorial role with Vulcan and attempted to aid the Romulan people after the Hobus supernova. Shinzon was the Riemann raised clone of Captain Picard who shook things up by killing most of the Romulan Senate and declaring himself Praetor. This created the initial power vacuum that set things in motion. Commander Donatra. The commander, which is a rank comparable to the captain in the Romulan military, not to be confused Starfleet's position, of a Romulan fleet. The IRW Valdor was hers and aided Picard in defeating Shinzon. She was 
of planets. Commander Saran was another Romulan in a similar position and her ally. Senator Talora. She survived the Riemann coup by being Shinzon's assassin and deploying the Thaleron trap that emptied the Senate. As one of the few surviving senators, she holds the position of Praetor. Commander Sela is the same Sela we saw throughout the next generation. She is half Romulan, who has very anti-Federation views, believing strongly in the power of the Star Empire. Admiral Taris of the IRW Harkona is the Romulan who discovered Iconia with her first officer, Hakiv. At the time, she was a sub-commander. General Zirmek took over leadership of the Riemann Kepazuk Battalion after Shinzon's power grab. He became a figurehead for the Riemann people and a proponent for the downtrodden. General Tabok, a Romulan commander who clashes with Taris on several political views and is an outspoken critic of her. He featured in the TNG episode, The Neutral Zone. General Valal, a friend of Tabok and fellow general, first seen as a liaison during the Dominion War. He commands the Imperial Second Fleet. Chulan is a Romulan noble descended from a respected house. He had little involvement in affairs before 2385. The Narada and Nero, a Romulan miner who is broken by the loss of his family and home. He blames the Federation and Vulcan for deliberately stalling and allowing Romulus to be destroyed. And finally, Rahaik, head of the Tau Shi'ar. Arguably he oversaw it during its most turbulent period, but wasn't responsible for its eventual decline into thuggery. He served no side but the empires and led several investigations into all parties that churned up a lot of things the politicians would rather remain hidden. So, while we test this warbird and get it operational, let's look into the timeline of events. It's a bit of a mess, even with me excluding some of the minutia, but I tried to colour code the differing factions to help out a bit. Consider this one of those political episodes of TNG. Those are fun. Right? So Spock's reunification movement started in 2368 and as mentioned this is where we first saw Datan. We're gonna gloss over most of the shows in the Dominion War and just watch all of that and skip ahead to 2379, known as Shinzon's Coup. Commander Denatra of the Imperial Third Fleet, Commander Saran of the Imperial Fifth, both fought alongside the Enterprise E at the Battle of Basin Rift and Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Upon their victory, Senator Talora became the Praetor, but only had the support of about half the Imperial Senate, as most of them were loyal to Dunatra and Saran. Sela sided with Talora. Barely a year later, the Remans, emboldened by Shinzo, led by General Zomek. Dunatra is sent to escort the USS Titan on behalf of the Federation and Captain Riker to try to help alleviate a growing sense of civil war. Praetor Talora opposed this idea, but Donatra, with the aid of the USS Titan, negotiated a tenuous peace. After being attacked by Romulan warbirds in deep space, however, Donatra suspected that Talora had played her hand at ridding herself of her sight and failed. Donatra's response was to officially declare herself Empress of a new Imperial Romulan state in 23. One. With the support of her fellow loyal military allies, she took over several worlds, including Viranat. The Federation continued to try to placate the growing friction and avoided taking sides as civil war brewed in earnest. The Federation's Klingon allies, however, didn't help matters as they openly supported the Imperial State by officially recognising it as a political power in the hopes it would further destabilise the Romulan Empire. This left the Federation kind of face palming in exasperation as their precarious balancing act was trampled by the subtlety of a rampaging Targ. Ultimately, this meant that the Federation had to reluctantly support the Klingons, which also meant acknowledging the new faction as a legitimate power. On the plus side, the Imperial State was friendlier with the Federation than the Star Empire ever was. Spock also returned to Federation space in 2381, leaving the reunification movement as an underground but sustained power, confident in its ability to continue without his active presence. General Zirmek, the Riemann general from earlier, made an alliance with the Romulan unificationists, supporting their efforts and sheltering them from the Star Empire and state alike. 
All systems are go with full impulses back online. Picking up a distress signal. Must be people from the colony. Four colonists managed to escape the surface. Ah, Viranat survivors. Let's see if we can find them. The distress signal is close. Searching. There. We have to help them. Will do. So, where were we? In 2382, the reunification movement comes forward and seeks official recognition on the Senate, while the Federation is asked to mediate the return of Donatra's seized colonies to the Star Empire. That recon ship is searching for survivors. Let's take it out while we have the opportunity. Well, speaking of opportunity, while the Romulan state and empire were clashing and the Federation was distracted trying to maintain the peace, the Klingons take back Kitima and several other worlds that had been occupied by an expanding star empire. By 2383 and 4, the Romulans are descending into open conflict with each other as officials, colonies and fleets declare their support for either Dunatra or Talora. Commander Celia is promoted and made proconsul, second only in command to the Praetor Talora, while Admiral Taris defects to join the Imperial State, bringing a sizeable fleet to Dunatra's cause. This eventually leads Talora to deciding to finally open talks with the Imperial State in earnest. Taris attends the peace talks as a representative of the Imperial State, but Praetor Talora, however, is assassinated in her sleep shortly afterwards. And Sela blames the Romulan reunification movement and its allied Remans, including Zeomek. Despite this setback, the peace talks continue and lead to a merger of the Star Empire and the State. Senator Chulan, a favoured Romulan noble, becomes Praetor. Donatra was made head of the military, while Sela remained as proconsul. Chulan, however, lacked the iron resolve that his former Praetor had, and more notably, the resolve shared by both Donatra and Sela. Effectively, he would be caught in a tug of war between the two. I'm back on the bridge, and I figured out how I can improve our torpedoes. Just give me the order, and I'll get started. Scanners are picking up more colonists and tall Shi'ar nearby. We have to rescue our friends. One of Donatra's acts is to sway the Praetor to force more reforms in the way of official dialogues with Colonel Zermak and the Remans, giving them the planet Craterus. Picard resigns from Starfleet and becomes the Federation ambassador on Vulcan in this time too. The head of the town Shi'ar, Riaik, was soon found assassinated, and all fingers point to Sela, who had mounting disagreements with the organisation and its investigations into Talora's death. Donatra exiled Sela rather than executing her as the Tao Shi'ar wished, applying pressure to the Praetor. Sela left with her supporters and charted a course for the Delta Quadrant rather than travelling towards Federation or Klingon space. Around this time, Taris was called to Livari V, far away from the Romulus system, to investigate ancient Romulan relics supposedly unearthed there. The Narada, mining in the Hobus system, detects signs star is going critical and has to flee the system. Ambassador Spock's calculations warn that the supernova will occur very soon, but something is amiss. This supernova will likely travel through subspace. He returns to Vulcan to petition for aid. Ultimately, his and Picard's attempts are too late to save Romulus and Remus. Captain Nero of the Narada executes the surviving Romulan Senate for Caldis, including Praetor. Donatra and Zemek were missing, presumed destroyed, as they had been en route back to Romulus and passing by the Hobus system. Their last transmission reported an intense ion storm-like phenomena. In the aftermath, many Romulan worlds began to declare themselves as the new seat of power, with a variety of intent. Some welcome Federation aid, others unsure and suspicious deny it, and others still assume that Starfleet may have even had some play in the Hobus event. Admiral Taris is the highest ranked member of the Star Empire left in the military and orders the convergence of the entire Romulan fleet to consolidate its people. But this state of uneasy leadership is challenged routinely and no civilian government can establish itself for several years. Starfleet aid is still sporadic due to mistrust in the civilian sectors, so the Federation attempts to host talks for leadership, but they too fail. Oh, right, the refugees. Quickly, beam them aboard. Thank you. We we 
Right, by 2390, factions have begun to form among the Romulan people. The colony world of Tau even requests Federation membership. Taris has been making slow progress, consolidating loyal military officers and gradually restoring the chain of command in the military, but she's made no efforts to simply overpower the colonies with force. It's not long before factions begin pledging their support to Taris, despite her being disinterest in politics. One year later, Rator III begins to house the new capital for the Star Empire, Rehan, financed by Admiral Taris's efforts. Some suggest the restoration of the Senate, others a monarchy. Taris uses her military and growing political power to leverage a slightly more democratic approach, saying that any leader must be elected and that she will not just declare herself empress. The Colonial Organisational Committee is established to create a government. Taris and a General Tabok clash about the role of the military in this new government. Taris wishes to protect all of the Star Empire's space, while Tabok wishes to pull back its citizens from their colony worlds to better defend and manage them. Eventually, Taris, to the surprise of no one, is elected Praetor, but in the new government, the Senate holds the majority of the powers. In 2395, with the balance of power upset by the destruction of Romulus, the Federation attempts to restore the scales between the Klingons, the Romulans and themselves, and new treaties, including upholding the Federation's Treaty of Alderaan that ban Starfleet cloaking tech, are signed. Meanwhile, Starfleet agents have been keeping an eye on Sela, who has been seen returning and setting up shop in the Beta Quadrant, and is consolidating resources through illicit trade and enslaving pre-warp species to mine decolithium. In 2397, the Kevratas colony is ravaged by a plague and famine, and declares its independence from the Star Empire due to the lack of aid it has received. Taris responds with force, dispatching Tabok to eliminate them. However, he instead negotiates a peace with the colony, and the Senate overrules Taris's charge of insubordination and pardons him, making public display of the weaknesses of Taris's rule. Tabok also promotes an opponent of Taris to command the Second Fleet, a General Velal, and Taris attempts to change the law so that all promotions of a certain rank must be approved by the Senate. The Senate approves this, but this action also makes it apparent to everyone that power plays are still present in the Empire. By the 2400s, the Senate has voted to restrict the Praetor's power further, as General Tabok dies in suspicious circumstances. Of all people, Sela from the edges of the Empire begins to investigate claims of foul play in secret through a network of loyalists that remained after her exile. General Vilal, the commander of the Second Fleet and staunch ally of the deceased Tabok, meets with Sela to discuss her findings, and together they come to the conclusion that Praetor Taris is responsible and must be dethroned. I think it's safe to say we're a fully operational ship. I'm getting an alert. There's another distress signal coming in from one of the colony's shuttles. We can do a short-range warp jump to get to them. Do you want to go now? Or stay here to wipe out any other incoming drones. They look like they'll be coming in to do sweeps in the area. No, let's move out now. A second civil war erupts with the sides marked out. General Valal allied with the returned commander Sela against Praetor Taris, and soon Romulan worlds begin to take sides. This war lasted for just over three years, with skirmishes and fighting along many Romulan colonies. By the time the Second Fleet made it to Rator III in the close of 2403, Praetor Taris was long gone, having fled in secret. Sela wasted no time stepping into the power vacuum, naming herself Praetor and General Velal as military commander. Sorry, the Senate named her Praetor, willingly, with no coercion from Velal's fleet of warbirds in orbit. By 2404, the dust has settled and Sela has brought stability to the Empire. However, her methods have been increasingly despotic and included blackmail, constant propaganda and military control, all while allowing the Tal Shiar increasing leniency under her second-in-command, Colonel Hakeev. Increasing military power and frequent use of the Tal Shiar is shaping the Star Empire into a mirror of what it was before the unification efforts. On top of this, Sela had returned with no small number of unusual allies from her time as an exile, such as a small group of Herogen from the edges of the Delta Quadrant and the Alachi. 
there is no small number of planets that are growing disillusioned by their empress and government in general and after the constant state of unease, who can blame them? It's from these ashes that Datan, the former young man and protege of Spock, steps forward with an intent to drive off the predatory actions of Sela and her Hakiv. There aren't any colonies here. Just this strange ship. I've never seen anything like this in my life. It's gigantic. Engineering reports that the ship has scanned us, but they're not responding to my hails. What should we do? It's got the same colour scheme as the vessel that attacked Viranat. Let's give it a scan. They've done something to the ship. Nothing is responding. I can't even warp us out of here. I think I might be able to get a comm channel up to hail them. What do you want me to do? Ask them what they want with our ship. We're getting a reply. What the... They seem to be rearranging our words and sending them back. Listen. I'm picking up another ship. This one is Tall Shiar. It's decloaking. So the Alachi were right. A handful of pitiful Romulan refugees managed to escape. When will you colonists learn that no matter how far you run, you cannot escape your obligations? Speak of the devil. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Colonel Hakiv of the Tall Shiar. On behalf of the Romulan Star Empire, I hereby lay claim to this colony and all of its inhabitants. Surrender now, and I will ensure that you serve us in the way you are most suited. Never. We would rather die than serve the Tal Shiar, and so would my crew. Don't have you done to ask me? It's fine. They agree with me. Fire weapons at will. Yeah, without shields or power, we we can't move. We're done for. This is Tamer of the Romulan Republic. Tal Shiar vessel, stand down immediately. Oh, the Republic surprise attack seems to have distracted them. We're free. Tamer, how fortunate! I can destroy both. What ensues is a fairly one-sided battle against the Tal Shiar vessel captained by Akiv. I'm not too sure about the Republic, but they're not the ones firing at us, so that'll do. The Alachi vessel seems to have vanished altogether, so we're going to enter the fray with our underpowered warbird. The Duderodex class still employs tractor beam tricks, this time forcing us away from the vessel to reduce our accuracy. After sustained punishment, something explodes inside the Tal Shiar bridge. My eye! So the insect has managed to sting me! You think you've won? This is not the end! Even now, more of my ships are on their way! And the next time, you won't have anyone to protect you! We can deny that we ever needed protection, kind of not true as we were all about to die seconds ago, so I'll just settle for trying to menace Akiv by telling him not to cross our paths again. When we're done, Tamer of the Romulan Republic hails I am us. Tamer, commander of the Romulan Republic. We picked up your distress signal while on a mission in a nearby system. I would say we arrived just in time given your ship's condition. Who are you? And what happened here? We recount the events of the abductions, the attacks, and the presence of the Tal Shiar. I am truly sorry. This is not the first time I've heard a story like this, and I fear it will not be the last. And these Ilachi creatures, they are troubling. We need to know more about them and why they're working with a snake like I was. As I said, I'm with the Romulan Republic. We are not the terrorists the Tal Shiar make us out to be. With our leader, Natan, we are working to gather survivors of the destruction and fight the tyranny of the Tal Shiar. We have a flotilla nearby. If you're interested, we would welcome you and your friends to join us there. After all the recent history, I'm hesitant to join up with any Romulan faction vying for power. I understand your hesitation, but you must realize that there's no running from what's happening. You saw what the Tal Shiar did to your 
They're doing the same from all across the sector. To serve them or you die. The only way we're going to survive is fight back. And we don't have much choice with the condition we're in, so we'll go with you. I appreciate your willingness to do what's right. I'm transmitting the coordinates of our flotilla to your ship now. When you arrive, we can repair your vessel and work out our next move. Thank you again. I'll make sure you won't regret your decision. Now Romulan history tells a different story. I hope I don't regret this. I don't know how I feel about this, but I guess signing with Tamer is better than risking death on our own. Andy did help us out with the Tall Shiar. The coordinates are loaded up whenever you're ready to go. I think the colonists we rescued are eager to get someplace safe. We set a course for the Fratilla, leaving behind a raised world that only hours ago we called home. Assistant to Commander Tamir. Please follow me to the Commander's quarters. There is much to discuss. Commander, our guests have arrived. Excellent. I'll get them up to speed. There is much to do. I'll be glad to show one of you around while the other stays and talks with Tamir. I'll take the tour and then meet you back on the ship when you're ready. I guess with Devex gone, that warbird is ours. We're aboard Tamer's vessel, the Disarak, in a convoy of ships that serves as the so-called Republic's base. I know what I've heard about the Republic, a radical group intent on reforming a new Romulan government, but I've got to say, if this is it, I'm not impressed. Good to see you and Tovan have made it to the flotilla of the new Romulan Republic. To be brief, we are a group that was founded by Tatan to combat the tyranny of Empress Sila and her Tal Shia. Our goal is to unify the shattered Romulan people under a new democracy instead of Sila's tyrannical rule. There is much to do, however. I can answer any questions you may have. So who are you to know in this fledgling democracy? I am the commander of this fleet. No actions happen without my approval. Before this, I worked in intelligence for the Romulan military, which allowed me to learn more about the Tal Shiar. I couldn't stomach the thought of working alongside her. Ditan approached me one day and said he needed someone to organize a defense against the Tal Shiar. I accepted before he could finish his sentence. Is there anything else? I've heard of Ditan, but what did he actually do to form the Republic? Ha! <laughs> what hasn't Ditan done? He has quite the long history. The short version is that he desires to see the reunification of the Vulcans and the Romulans. Before that can happen, though, Datan wants us to find a new homeworld, reconcile with the Remus, and end the centuries of oppression beneath the Tal Shiar. We're Romulans, and after all that's happened, we still have our pride and our cultural heritage. We need to be able to approach the Vulcans as equals, not as refugees looking for charity. Did you want to know anything else? <laughs> I like the sound of that. Pride has been the downfall of our species in the past, but we're Romulans. It's in our blood. That's right. He dreams of a day when our two people are united. Well, three, counting the humans. The town was inspired by Ambassador Spock, who first began the movement. When he was a child, Spock was working on Romulans with the reunificationists, and he was the town's teacher. The Tulshia were actively opposed to reunification. Spock and his people had to keep their movement hidden, working with allies and meeting in secret. It's been an uphill battle for the time, but he won't stop until he sees the Vulcans, the Romulans, and the Remans reunited in their peace. Is there anything else? No, that about covers it. What's next? What's next is that you receive our uniform and get a tour of the flotilla. After that, you'll receive your first assignment. However, you must understand that by joining us, you mark yourself as an enemy to the Tal Shiar. Akiv and his people will see you as a threat, and there isn't anything they want to do to stop. Are you ready to accept that? Better to be seen as a threat than prey. I mean... Good. You should get yourself down to Lieutenant Delathab. You can get a uniform from him if you want to change out those civilians. 
also have your ship, Kamina. We can't get you into a more powerful vessel yet, but we can change the appearance of your ship if you want. When you're done, return to your ship. I should have your first assignment ready and sent to your ship by then. Well, at least the sun has a plan laid out. Steps. Find a new home, ally with the equally sporadic and persecuted Remans, and rebuild from there. We could do worse without a home. The only other options are to return to the Star Empire, whose Tao Shiar just attacked us, or side with the Republic. And at least the Republic have numbers. I suppose we could skulk back to the Vulcans and ask for a handout, but the Romulans are an innately prideful people, as are the Vulcans, despite all of their talk of logic and serenity. Or at least that's how the Romulans see them. The Federation would likely offer help too, but again, to Mars of point, we need to rebuild ourselves, not just assimilate into a Federation way of thinking. At the end of the observation lounge on the port side of the ship, staring into space, is Datan himself. Let's go have a chat and hear about his plans in his own words. Hello again. Now that you're settling in, I wanted to speak with you about what our overall goals will be. First and foremost, we are looking for a new planet to call home. Tamer and his crew are handling that search. While the search continues, I am working on any possible alliances that we can make with the Federation and the Klingon Empire. We will need allies if we are to proceed. Your task will be the protection and recovery of other Romulans spread throughout the sector. I know of a couple, but are there really that many colonies? We are finding more by the day. Some have already joined us, but others do not believe in our cause. It will be up to you and your crew to protect these colonies from the Tal Shiar and to recruit anyone willing to assist us. Do you have any questions? If not, I would suggest you return to your ship. Tamer will have his orders ready for you. So Tamer's planet hunting. Has he found anything yet? Not yet. He and his crew have been assisting Romulan colonies throughout the region, and he has not been able to focus his efforts on the search. With you here, however, Tamer's mission to find a new homeworld can begin. He will be sending scout ships to analyze nearby planets. We'd prefer to find a suitable world in this sector. But we'll expand our search if we need to do so. And you mentioned an alliance with the Federation, humans and Klingons? Will that really work? I do not know. Our history of deception with both groups definitely does not help. The Tal Shiar, however, will not attack the fleet for now. Sela would see such a direct action as too great a risk. She much prefers to work in the shadows. Let me worry about our potential allies. While you're away, I will be working with diplomats from both sides to come to an agreement we can all live with. Alright, I'll return to my ship and wait for specifics. Sounds like we've got our orders. If you're ready, I can beam you back to the ship. However, before that, I need to ask a favor. I have a sister. Her name is Rena Kev. She and I were separated a long time ago. I want to try to find her. As we're doing our missions, could you try to ask about Rena? Thanks. Sure thing, Tobin. And yeah, beam me back right now. So that's that then. We've allied ourselves with this Republic. It's barely more than a few ideals in fewer ships at the moment. But if we can establish ties with the Remans, we'll need to speak to Obersek. He's been trying to unify his people through military campaigns, and if the Federation and Klingons can agree not to harass us with their policies or combat, we might be able to make a go of things. The biggest threat out there to our own people right now is Sela and the Tao Shiar. We'd like to believe that this Republic is the way to end this cycle of scheming and power plays that litter the Romulan Senate, but history paints it as something inevitable. Donatra fought against Talora for control, who schemed with Shinzon. The Remans are still lacking a voice among the Romulan people. Taris was a military leader with no patience for politics who responded to most threats with a hammer, while her own generals plotted around her and tried to usurp her command. Sela returned from exile at a convenient time and brought an influx of hostiles and reshaped the Tao Shia into a rogue organisation. Maybe the Republic will work, but the question is, is it as incorruptible as Tatan believes?
but we'll have to deal with Sela and the Tao Shiar another day. And for that, we're going to need help. So we'll set about gaining some in the next part of the Star Trek Online story series. Until then, thank you for joining us as we explore this growing narrative and its interweaving plot threads, and I hope to see you again for the next part. Jo there are many factions and powers in the Star Trek universe, and not all of them are as open as the Federation in sharing information on their species. Even the Romulans, with all their closed borders and secrecy, have made themselves targets of the Federation intelligence and engaged in diplomatic relations several times throughout history. However, one scaly species has scant intelligence to scan as it's secluded and aggressively territorial. Not even their origin is known for certain. The Gorn. Hi there, Rick here again with the next Cultural Index, returning as always to the Star Trek universe and an iconic race, all due to the only prime timeline appearance that they have had in the original series. A Gorn also appeared in a single Enterprise episode, but this was set in the Mirror Universe, so canonically we don't know much about them. Therefore, great segments of this index will contain memory beta content to help construct an image of a race that otherwise is shrouded in obscurity. The first official contact with the Gorn came in 2267 when they attacked the Federation colony world of Cestus III, purging all the inhabitants from the planet's surface as the Gorn claimed it was in their space. As with the Ferengi, the Federation had been aware of the Gorn's existence for some time through second-hand information and the like, but had never encountered them in an official capacity, nor knew where they resided. We have on this general area. Virtually nothing, Captain. No records of any exploration. Until the Cestus III incident, which many term a massacre. Undoubtedly a brutal event, Cestus III was indeed in Gorn space, a fact unknown to the Federation, which has a habit of recklessly expanding into unexplored territory. After the massacre, relations between the Gorn and the Federation were tense for several years, but no offensive was ever conducted on either side. 2269 marked an end to the standoffish Federation Gorn rivalries, with the two powers eventually deciding to respect each other's territory. It's worth noting that Cestus III was a Federation colony again by 2371, so it's possible that the Gorn allowed the UFP to settle the world in reparation for the massacre. A very diplomatic gesture, if true. In 2282, a Federation shuttle crashed on a Gorn training planet. The Gorn actually sent a rescue party to help the survivors, which was then shot in fear. The issue was resolved with no further fatalities and the officers returned to the Federation. This shows that despite initial meetings as rivals, neither government wanted conflict. By 2370, the Federation and the Gorn relations were peaceful, if not productive. However, during the Dominion War, they apparently signed a non-aggression pact with the Dominion. In 2374, a political upheaval saw the Black Crest faction take a more militant approach to the Federation, and some hostilities ensued. Despite this, they eventually fought alongside the Federation in the final days of the Dominion War, thanks to a diplomatic mission from the Enterprise E. By 2379, diplomatic relations were expected to resume as before, though some sources say that rising Klingon interests in Gorn space is a prelude to a takeover from the Empire. The Gorn's homeworld is an unknown. Most sources say that it's a great jungle planet known as Gornar to the Federation, or Agornu, located in the Tau Lakure system of the Beta Quadrant. The Gorn call it Sasagaron, though there is a different legend to their origin which we'll address in a minute. The jungle world has a humid, muggy atmosphere and great swamps that spread for miles before giving way to ocean. For easier navigation and perhaps the preservation of the landscape, or the avoidance of the large, dinosaur-like creatures that roam the surface, most travel was conducted by a network of caves and underground tunnels. Gornal's gravity is 1.4 g's, explaining why they have naturally higher musculature and very slow movements by galactic averages. So the number of different names and conflicting reports about the origin of the Gorn is further muddied with rumours that they are actually of extragalactic origin. 
There is a story that they originally arrived in the Beta Quadrant through a wormhole from another galaxy. This is unlikely, unless it happened thousands of years ago, but I cannot exactly prove otherwise, so I thought I'd mention it here. This data comes from the Kelvin timeline, interestingly enough, however, it could tie into an older story that said the Gorn developed on three planets in the same system, Gdar 1, 2 and 3, however after the invention of interplanetary travel it was discovered that none of these worlds were the origin of the species, and they came from elsewhere, so perhaps they really are extragalactic in origin, or these could simply be colony worlds in Gorn space. After all, the Gorn were sending out colony ships before the invention of warp drive in their culture, so perhaps a few worlds splintered off. Frustratingly, we just don't know for certain. Biologically, the Gorn are reptilian, cold-blooded. They would likely require a hot environment to function on their ships. They had a near-humanoid skeletal structure with a very high muscle mass. They had red, iron-based blood and a tough leather hide that was covered in scales. Much slower but vastly stronger than humans, they could even survive in a vacuum for a time. Predatory in nature, they had sharp fangs, reptilian eyes and talons for rending flesh, giving them a fearsome visage. One which most humans reacted unfavourably to. They can and will bite in combat, and have even eaten other sentient species before. Most species cannot understand their speech, a series of hisses and guttural noises, so they utilise universal translators. Gorn males are around 215 kilograms and 2 meters tall. The females are bigger. Despite this, it seems only the males serve in the military, suggesting perhaps that the females make up less of the population, or that a caste-based system prevents them from serving. The government of the Gorn is called the Hegemony, and at its head, the Imperator though there are also many references to political power residing with a king. Perhaps these roles are one and the same, king of the Gorn and imperator of the military, in the same way a monarch or a president is the commander-in-chief. It appears that they operate in a caste-based system, with a distinct warrior, technology and civilian roles. This same source describes the castes as based on the conditions in which a Gorn is hatched with incubation variations causing genetic divergence among the species, some being born bigger, good for combat, whilst some have more digits, favourable for more complicated tasks. Ones born with a bluish-yellow scale coloration are considered special and blessed. The space arm of the Gorn is simply the Space Command, and operates ships with the prefix GCS, such as the Gressril. The technology of the Gorn rivalled that of the Federation during the 23rd century, though it was likely outpaced by the neighbouring power by the 24th. They utilised genetic engineering and biological developments to a greater extent than most species, even for military application. Their ships followed a similar design principles to the Federation vessels, suspending two or more warp nacelles from pylons attached to a central hull. The bridge sat atop the primary hull, and their vessel's firepower could match that of a constitution class, with even more powerful shields. They favoured disruptor technology, and their ships were just as fast as Starfleet vessels, with similar limitations. They dress to discern rank and position over necessity, as their scales are protective of the elements, though it would be prudent for them to develop some sort of heated undergarment, seeing as they're, you know, cold-blooded. They do wear harnesses and leather-like gear, likely non-replicated, as due to their predatory nature, animal skins would not exactly be in short supply. Although they shape metals for armour, they have very little jewellery. It has been said that the Gorn captain that fought Kirk on Cestus III was wearing a tactical eyewear, a sort of heads-up display, but I find it unlikely that the Metrons would negate to strip this bit of technology when they removed everything else so I'm putting this down to another example of bioengineering. They also have produced a concoction called Meridor, a blue drink that shows us that they do at least have a functioning agricultural arm, and therefore there's less chance that they rely on plunder and piracy. They appear quite primitive to most species' preconceptions, but really aren't. Although they favoured overpowering a foe outright, they utilised subterfuge and trickery to engineer species into situations where the Gorn's natural advantages came into play. They have names like Slathis, 
Slar, Sisli, Zugazun, Sistas, Thrak, and Kastar. These pronunciations are as close to their names as most species can manage, as they have an entirely different vocal structures. Slar was from the Mirror Universe, however, and was a slave master hired by the Tholians. This suggests that they may utilise their threatening visage and physical superiority for security or enforcement roles. They bury the dead and consider grave sites to be protected, perhaps even sacred. Some form of ancestor worship, perhaps? But they are said to believe in the mistress of fertility, Siyahaza, who watched over the eggs and hatchlings while keeping an eye out for the Great Father, who was banished to the depths of space for attempting to consume the young. Eusis... Eusis... Bloody hell, these words. Eusikasur was a concept of destiny, a philosophy that would go hand in hand with their adherence to a caste structured society. Although official sources list them as xenophobic, a deeper look into their culture, or suspected culture anyway, gives me the impression that they are sort of more incredibly territorial and simply assume hostile intent on any unknown interlopers. Once the Federation and its motivations were known to the Gorn, they were never really a problem again, adopting diplomacy where appropriate uh, to preserve their way of life, which is more than can be said for many other races. But don't get me wrong, they are predatory by nature and highly dangerous, but they show a willingness to overcome their instincts and can see the larger picture. Antagonising every other race out there is going to be a bad move, after all, they are a relatively small territory. However, it's likely that as their technology is surpassed by other races, they may find themselves the target of others or dragged into conflicts they would rather avoid, especially if their assiduous defence triggers an incident. Thanks for listening to this index. As mentioned, a lot of this is beta content, but outside of the arena episode, we literally know nothing else prime timeline about them, which is a shame as I really like some of the concepts presented here, like their homeworld and their ship designs. What about you? Do you mind the amount of info here from non-canon sources? And of course, as usual, the index moves to a new target culture next, with either the Fallout Universe's inhabitants who would save us from ourselves, the Brotherhood of Steel, or the survivors of the Battlestar universe, the Colonial Fleet. So until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks again for watching, and goodbye. This Antviv and this Antviv are on two very different versions of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. This moment is one of the most important moments in Fresh Prince's run for that very reason. Will greets on Viv, Jazz makes this comment. You know, Miss Banks, since you had that baby, there's something different about you. <laughs> and then he breaks the fourth wall and looks directly at us to make, well, as if to acknowledge the viewer and say, yep, this is just what it is now, let's move on. What the show obviously didn't address is why there was suddenly a new Aunt Viv. Why one of the most important characters on television at the time was suddenly an entirely different woman played by an entirely different actress. What we didn't know is that Aunt Viv didn't leave, she was kind of fired. And what I think is more interesting is not just how and why she was fired, but how the show changed relatively dramatically after she was. This is the story of the two versions of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, a split that got the show cancelled, and how those two versions of the show came to exist, and the show itself. Came back. I came in on your Aunt Vivian can be quite bossy sometimes. Oh, well, you didn't hear the part where I said, boys, the rest of the statement is completely untrue. Will Smith had no professional acting experience when NBC decided to build the show around him. He was a rapper, and at the time, nothing more. And Will struggled, and trust me, this is important for the active switch. Will struggled to the point where the network almost fired and recast him after the first few episodes were filmed. And yet, the pilot and in turn the show would quickly become a success. And Will grew as an actor, but that process was slow. Yet things went smoothly on set and behind the scenes for most of the first season, and the show would get renewed. But it was apparently the second season where things really started to go downhill. According to Janet Hubert, it was around this time that she started to become upset with the culture of the show and its cast. 
She thought that Will and Ribeiro, as well as the rest of the cast, weren't taking their jobs seriously, and that it made it hard for the show to be worth watching, and it made it even harder for her to do her job. And Hubert, much like her character, wasn't going to stay quiet about it. There were reports that during the filming of the second season, she began to verbalize her complaints on set. There were reports that she would yell at Will mid-scene when he made a mistake, and that she approached him directly at one point and confronted him about what she deemed childish behavior on set and about his penchant for joking around and having a good time. But these things would really come to a head for, well, everyone, and the studio in the show's third season. Wait a minute. Boy, do not test me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Who would say later when asked about the situation within the third season of the show that she, Janet Hubert, as he put it, really wanted the show to be the Aunt Viv show. And it was further reported that Janet Hubert was quoted as saying that she's been acting all her life and this punk kid comes in and they build a show around him. She didn't understand how that's possible. And that third season would prove to be the end of the line. She'd say that she simply couldn't do her job because of Will's attitude and Alfonso Ribeiro, Carlton, would say in response that it was Hubert whose outbursts and attitude were creating a miserable work environment for everybody. Hubert resented the fact, and she would admit this, that Will hadn't acted, and was upset that he needed to learn how to do so well throughout the process of the show's filming. And even more, she resented the fact that she wasn't being paid a number that she thought was fair. According to her, NBC offered to renew her contract at a rate that didn't include enough growth in pay over the seasons, and this infuriated her. Now, it's worth pointing out that I personally couldn't find anyone confirming this but Hubert, but according to her, she wanted more. She didn't get it. Her behavior towards the cast, and Will in particular, wasn't creating an environment where anyone wanted to fight to keep her aboard, and so Hubert, the original Aunt Viv, was terminated. What happened next would almost help kill the show altogether, but was also unlike anything we've ever seen on television. And what is that supposed to mean? Oh, too many big words. <laughs> no, Miss Thing, but I got a couple of small words for you. Some of the show's most iconic episodes were Janet Hubert, Aunt Viv related. Before her departure, the show used her as a way to establish a strong female presence in the house. She was often the show's vehicle to discuss and explore female dynamic and real issues. We saw episodes like this, where she tries to prove to herself that age is nothing but a number, that she's still got it, and that she's independent. But not only that, that she's made the right choices in life as a wife and a mother. Or the episode where Will and Carlton fight for African studies in hopes that they get an easy A, and Aunt Viv becomes their teacher really forces them to process and understand the history of their culture. Or even the mall episode where Viv turns the recording booth into a concert hall. In the first three seasons, this character was not just almost always the voice of reason, but she was the primary focus of a lot of the show's plot lines. The show was written with Aunt Viv at the forefront of that writing. Hubert was a phenomenal actress that played Viv as a strong woman that fought for herself and never wanted to be unheard. And this show succeeded. Its highest ratings were in the third season with Janet Hubert as Aunt Viv. But once Hubert was fired, well, the show's dynamic shifted. Nikki was born and Aunt Viv went from a strong independent woman to a quiet background character for most of the show's ensuing run. Episodes would stop focusing so much on her and would treat her as a lesser character, and the plot lines and the stories that were once written for that character fell mostly to Ashley, who would quickly develop a much larger role in the show's writing. This was a very different Fresh Prince from season 4 on. One that was grounded almost exclusively by Uncle Phil, and much less so by Aunt Viv, and one that became much more focused on the kids than it did their parents as a result. And a version of the show that coincided with ratings that simply did not live up to the network's expectations. So much so that the show was actually cancelled after Daphne Reed's first season, the fourth season of the show in totality. That was supposed to be it, season four and done. The Fresh Prince would end with a season finale and the network would move on. Yet, the world wanted more. A lot more, actually, and thousands, hundreds of letters and petitions were created and sent to NBC for months after the season four cancellation. So many, in fact, that the network decided to renew the show for a fifth season and eventually a sixth season. Seasons that would continue a ratings decline and included Daphne Reed as Aunt Viv. It actually got bad enough internally that the season 5 finale was written to potentially be the end of the show just in case NBC happened to pull the plug once the season had ended. It 
happened to be renewed for a sixth, and the sixth season's finale was written with the knowledge from everybody internally that this would indeed be the last episode of the show. And it's worth saying that Reed didn't necessarily make the show intrinsically worse, and in fact, a lot of my favorite episodes are post-Huber, but it's undeniable that she was a great Aunt Viv, and it's also undeniable that the world did not respond to Daphne Reed's Aunt Viv nearly as much and nearly as well. And the show was at its best, for the most part, when Hubert played the character. Jenny Huber and Daphne Maxwell Reed tell the tale of two princes. But regardless, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is to this day a phenomenal show. It's a slice of the very late 80s and early 90s culture that is still funny and sometimes even remarkably resonant to this day from season 1 to season 6. It's a show that dealt with things eventually that were much more dramatic and much more serious. The reason, by the way, is that Will himself was inspired by some of the more dramatic episodes of this show and asked the writers himself to create a few more dramatic episodes. And those succeeded as well, and a lot of those episodes are still important pieces of television today. But very few shows in television history can survive recasting a lead character entirely the way that Fresh Prince did. I mean, could you imagine watching this episode live when it aired? You've been watching The Fresh Prince for three seasons each week. It's primetime television, and there's no functional mass internet at the time. So one night, you turn on Fresh Prince for the season premiere, and in walks this woman, and she's Aunt Viv, and this is what you see? It's a moment of strange confusion that modern television literally could never replicate. You know, Miss Banks, since you had that baby, there's something different about you. <laughs> Millions of people sitting in their home looking at this face. Yeah, well, I'd imagine that's how every viewer felt sitting at home, too. That is it for today's episode of Nerdstalgic. If you enjoyed this video, press that like button down below. If you haven't yet hit subscribe, press that button too. That way you don't miss anything I put out. Also, next to the subscribe button is a little bell. That little bell is just the notification bell. If you press it, it'll just make sure you're actually notified when I upload, which is super helpful for actually